nail prints with his nail prints on his feet, his hands, and his forehead with the uh, thorn crown um, um, bruise uh, um, injuries. All right, so we'll see him in the physical form, but he is God. He took on the the um, flesh. He took on flesh. First uh, Timothy three sixteen. Now, so we studied that, but we also made sure we understand Jesus is one person or two persons. So if one person is God, the other person is man. Is Jesus one person or two persons? One person or two persons? Um, Vincent? One person. Very good. Must remember he is one person. Huh? But how many natures? Two natures. 100% man, 100% God. But even in his human nature, he has no sin. All right? So he is the perfect man. Two natures, but one person. All right? Very important. Um, as we study Trinity later on, we will get clearer about this God in three persons. Blessed Trinity, right? Three persons. So he is one person with two natures, sinless. So that is, we studied, that is what we studied about our Saviour. He is God, the very God. Now, today we study about his works. So we study about the person. Now we want to study about our Saviour's work. What did he come to do? And specifically about salvation work. Salvation work. Now let us turn to our BBK book. I want us to read a few Bible verses. Okay, let's turn to page 55. Page 55. Now, let's read. The, can you see Mark 10, 45 under his death? Let's read together. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Here the Lord Jesus specifically said, Why did I come to earth? For this purpose to give my life a ransom for many. Underline this word, ransom. I came to give my life a ransom for many. This is the work that Jesus Christ came to do. Now, what is ransom? You know, like someone gets kidnapped and then someone asks for ransom before he gets freed, right? A payment. So this ransom is, there is a re redemption price. I came to pay a redemption price. You get, you get kidnapped, hopefully your parents will pay the redemption price. They say, oh, okay, I love my child, I'll pay to redeem the child from the kidnappers, all right? So now, when the law says a ransom, now this is a very important theological understanding that we must have about our Lord Jesus Christ's work. Redemption price, this is what is called the substitutionary atonement. Substitutionary atonement. Our salvation, the Lord Jesus' work, is a substitution work. He pay a price, we get redeemed. Now, how do we know more, how can we see more about this substitutionary work? There, there are verses in the Bible that tells us very clearly, the Lord himself says that. Can you turn to page 57, please? Why did Jesus Christ come to redeem a ransom. He came to pay a ransom. Can you see page 57? 57, under God's love manifest in the cross. Let's read um, Romans 5, 8 together. God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Underline Christ died for us. What does it mean, Christ died for us? Christ died in our place. That's called substitution. We are supposed to die and pay for our sins, pay for the penalty. Substitutionary death is we're supposed to die um, to pay for our sins. God took our place, took our place, died for us. Now, you look further down. Um, can you see the verse that is under victory of the cross? And the victory of the cross. Can you read First um, Peter three eighteen? Now it says, "Now Christ suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God." So the just for the unjust, he took the just person took our place. We are unjust, but he took our place. 
Now, so why, why is it important to understand all this? Because then we begin to understand why exactly the Lord Jesus um, came in the way He came. Turn to back to page 55, please. Under God's plan of salvation. Now, under God's plan of salvation, first thing we understand that is substitutionary death, right? Substitutionary death. Now, second, we have to understand, look at the bottom of the page. Bottom of the page. So God has a plan of salvation even before creation. It was all carefully thought out how Satan's evil plot could be nullified by the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, without blemish and without spot. Remember in the Old Testament? Hmm, actually, this is not good. Uh, okay. So make sure all can see. Remember in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, this is the New Testament. In the Old Testament, what did God command them to do when they commit sin? They must sacrifice an animal, specifically a lamb, right? I don't know how to draw lamb. Okay, maybe it don't look like a lamb, but they're supposed to be a lamb, all right? Sacrifice a lamb. And this, the lamb that they bring to God for sacrifice must be what? Without blemish. Without blemish. They must select very carefully. Pure, without spot, without injuries, is the purest, without blemish. Then they sacrifice to God. We all know why they do that. Did this lamb, did this lamb um, wash away their sins? No. The lamb was a symbol that points them to the Lord Jesus Christ. What did John say the Lord Jesus is? He is the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. All the while in the Old Testament when they make sacrifices, they are not thinking that this lamb is dying on their behalf. They know that one day, the Lord Jesus Christ will come and He's the Lamb of God that will die on their behalf. Substitution, remember? Substitution. That's why when they, when they sacrifice the lamb, do you remember what they must do? The sinner brings the lamb and the sinner will put his hand on top of the lamb. Hmm? Put his hand on top of the lamb. Do you understand what that means? The sinner knows, I am transferring my sin, my sin, onto another, another that bears my sin for me. In this case, the, the lamb without blemish. And they know that one day I will transfer, one day my sins will be transferred on Christ. He died in my place. Now this time, the lamb is dying in his place. But they know in their minds very clearly, they are taught very clearly, this lamb is pointing to Christ. Because Christ hasn't come, right? So that is what it means. Um, so, without blemish. Now, I'm going to then help us to understand our Lord Jesus Christ, why he came. Why are we studying this? Because we want to know exactly our Saviour's heart, why He came, what He did. And I hope by knowing that, you love Him more. Understand that? And you will defend Him. Little children, no, little children, no more little children. Oh God, young ones. Now, the more you know of what your parents do for you, the more you will love them, correct? Very often, we don't love our Saviour because we know very little of what He does for us. So we must understand, and we also must understand the theology behind it so that we are sound in our understanding. And also then you know exactly how you are saved. Do you know exactly how you are saved? Sometimes you say, I'm saved, but exactly how? I don't really know. Worst of all, I don't really care. As long as I'm going to heaven, what the Lord Jesus Christ did and all that, I don't really care. Now, that's very sad. Okay, so we want to understand why the Lord came the way He came, why He lived the way He lived, why He died the way He died. Okay? So we understand that. Now, so I want to do this. God is 100% God, right? God is 100% man, right? Then I want to put something else. I asked you last week, perfect man or angel? The first question we must understand, Jesus Christ came to be our substitute, correct? So I ask you this, why can't God come as God? God just come and pay for our sins as God. Right? God is very powerful, right? Can He do that? Of course, He can come. I come and pay for your sin as God. Why must the Lord Jesus be born of a virgin, born as a baby, then... Oh, here. 
born as a baby, baby, eh? then grow up to be man. Why can't he just come fully grown adult? Has the Lord Jesus Christ come fully as adult before? In the Old Testament, he did. He appeared to um, uh, Abraham, he appeared to other people as a human, fully grown human. He did not appear as a baby talking to human and wait for him to grow up. No, he appeared, he can. Why did he not come straight away as a full grown adult? So that's one question, right? We ask. Number two, why must he become man in the first place? Why, why not just God? Number three, we also ask if, if, well, we say because he must be a lamb without blemish, right? Means perfect, right? Well, because only God is perfect. So God must be the one, right? God must be the one. But let me ask you, are angels perfect? Angels have no sin, right? Angels have no sin. So why not angels? I don't know how to draw angels. Angels. Eh? All right, why not angel? Why not angel? They're perfect. Why not an angel come and die for us? Number one. Can God create a perfect man? A perfect Adam that has no sin. Can God do that? God did that in the Garden of Eden. God also can create a perfect man. Why must God himself become man? Why don't you just create a perfect man called, I don't, I don't know, Adam opposites, Mada, all right, Mada. When you call Mada, create Mada since Adam failed. Create Mada, Mada come perfect, and then I die for man. Why not? Why must God take on the form of a baby, grow up, become man? That is what your Savior go through, you know. Right before creation, when we fall, He already had the plan. I will come, become man, born as a baby, grow up in this world. Go to the cross, substitute the people I came to save. You know, young ones, when you begin to realize, why did daddy work so hard? Why did he take extra job? Then you begin to realize, oh, because my education was very expensive. He had to work very hard. You begin to realize, oh, that's what my dad did. When you begin to think you love them more, but when you think this is God, does God owe us anything? No, God don't owe us anything. We are, the Bible says, as worms before his eyes. Do you owe anything to a worm? Okay, there's a rat running down around in church. I don't know, we, can't, we haven't been able to catch it. Will you die for the rat? Hmm? Will you love the rat so much, you will die for it? You will go through a lot of things for the rat. We are worse than a rat before God. We are unclean sinners, haters of God, enemies of God. How many of you would die for your enemies? Go through a lot, a big plan to help him. We won't do that. But here is God doing all this for us. We must understand why. We must understand why. So here, we ask ourselves why. See if anyone can know. Number one, why must God himself come? Uh, Fiona, you want to try? Say again. Because he must be sinless. Number one, only God is sinless. All right, so because he's sinless, but why not a sinless angel? Young, because we sin against God, and only God. Okay, this is the deepest theological one. Huh? Only God can forgive sin. Only God can forgive sin. I repeat her statement: because we sin against God. And only God can forgive sin. Is all sin against God? Um, Rachel, if you lie to your parents, do you sin against your parents or you sin against God? Both, Both right? We can't say I lie to my parents, I only sin against my parents. All sin is against God because God is the setter of the commandments, the rules. So, what are we to understand this? I will explain in detail afterwards. All right? Number three, what else? Why not an angel? Why not a perfect man? Ichung. No, I'm thinking about God first. Why must God be the one who come? Why don't God make a man, an angel? Why must God be the one who die for our sins? Very good, because he's infinite. Is an angel infinite? No, he's a created being. He's a human, perfect man, infinite. No, he's still a man. 
but only God is infinite. Our sin, the payment for our sin is infinite. The need to pay for the world, sins of the world, all the believers, infinite. Can a man die for the sins of many? Cannot, because it's finite. Only God is infinite. So God in his mind, man has fallen, I can leave them alone and let them all perish. But God says, in order to save them, I do this, still can't save them. All right, I will personally come because I am infinite. That's why God himself took on um, the task to save men because he's infinite. Now, what about this one? Sinless, correct? Why not this one? Because only God is infinite. Now, what about this one? We must understand this theological truth and it is something that when we understand, we must love God. I give you an example. Um, maybe, so for example, I owe Caleb, I owe Caleb a huge amount of money, a billion dollars, all right? I owe Caleb a billion dollars. And then, um, I can't pay at all. And the only way for, if I can't pay, I go to jail for the rest of my life, okay? There is a payment to be made. So I owe him a billion dollars. And then, um, Esther comes along. Esther says, uh, Pastor, it's okay. Never mind. Forget about it. All right? It's forgiven. Just, just, just forget. Don't worry about it. Is the debt paid? Is the debt forgiven? So in what situation can I get out of that debt? Caleb. <laughs> If Caleb say, ah, all right, I write it off, bad debt, I just write it off. No need to pay, I write it off. Then I'm free, right? I'm free to go, right or not? You see, I sin against Caleb. Can someone else say, never mind, forgiven? No. Only God himself can say, I forgive. I forgive. But when Caleb forgives, Caleb say, one billion dollar... Very painful. I write it off. Ah. What happens to Caleb? Caleb, does Caleb suffer? Caleb suffered in loss. In order for Caleb to forgive, because I sin against him, I owe him, in, in order for him to forgive, Caleb must be willing to what? Take a hit himself. Right, he's going to be poor now. He's going to suffer himself now. I took all his money. He will suffer. This concept is the theological term for substitutionary death. Can humans substitute? Cannot, because the sin is not against human. The sin is against God. Only God can forgive the eternal punishment. That's why God must be the one who forgives. And, God must, and that is why Christ must come. Christ, can Christ just say, ah, these sinners, okay, I forgive you all. All right, let's move on. Can he say that? He is righteous. Sin has penalty, correct? Sin has penalty means someone must bear the penalty. And no one can bear the penalty except God himself is willing. So Caleb knew in order for me to say forget it, he knew in his heart, I am going to have to make a big payment, my, take a big hit myself. Christ decided to do that. So my friends, when, when we think of Christ, God himself coming, it's, it's not just we sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel, we're going to sing all this Christmas song, all this lovey-dovey. We must know exactly what God did, and then we will love Him more. Understand that? I hope when you understand this. Then I ask you this question. If God did all this for us when He don't owe us anything, why do we withhold anything from Him? Why? Why? If you begin to realize how much your parents suffer for you, then you know bit by bit, oh, my mom, my dad, they suffered all this for me. In order for me to have this, they had to suffer much. As you know more, then you begin, as you grow, you begin to grow, mature, and then you realize, how can I disobey them and hurt them? How can I hold back these things? That mom says, you know, um, I need help. No, I don't want to help you. No, I don't want to serve you. No, I don't want to take care of you. We begin to, in our heart, say, how can I not love God? Why must I hold on to this sin? If God says that is a sin, give it up. How can we continue to hold on when we realize all this? 
All right, so I hope we don't study theology and just, wow, now I know. Now I can go downstairs and tell people, you know why God came? You know why God came? It's not that. It's when we know we love Him more. Understand that? So now that, why God must come? Some reasons. So now the next thing is this. Why must God be man? Why must God be man? Why must God go from baby to adult? Why? Why can't God just... Okay, why can't God come as a spirit? Remember Paul said, if anyone denies that, or says that Christ came in the spirit only, did not come in the flesh, there's a false gospel. Why must God come as... Why can't God come as a spirit? Why must He take on the form of man? Why? Vincent? <laughs> okay. Firstly, a spirit. God is a spirit. Can God die? What is the penalty of sin? Physical and spiritual death, right? Can God die physically? God is a spirit. He cannot. So, another important theological understanding. God says, I must die, you know. Physically, He must die. So, he, because He must die. Because He must die physical death on our behalf. He substitute. Remember substitutionary? Once you understand substitutionary, a lot of theology becomes clear and you know, oh God, this is why you had to come. Now, because God cannot die, so He becomes man to die. What else? I think um, I Chung wanted to say this just now. Why must it be man? Why must He become a man? Why must He become a man? Another reason. Very good. A man... Now, remember, it's called ransom, substitution, remember? Substitution. Can an angel substitute a man? It is not the same. Can a lamb, you know, a real lamb, substitute man? Cannot. That's why it's called the Lamb of God. He's God himself, all right? It's all pointing. So, man is called federal headship. Man to substitute man. Man representing man. Understand that? Only a man can represent man, but yet he must be a god, not just an ordinary man. That is why an angel will not do. Okay, so um, anything else that you can remember? I think these are the key ones. All right, so I want to make sure I covered everything. Now, um, can you turn to page 57? Okay. Page 57. Can you see um, the second last paragraph? Second last paragraph. Now, there is Romans 5.19. Can we read Romans 5.19 together? For, as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one... Now, what is the meaning of this? What is the meaning of this? What is the meaning of this? By the... Let's look at the verse. Huh? Now, by the... For by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Who is this one man's disobedience? Who is this one man? Adam. Adam disobeyed God. All of us were born of him, became sinners, right? All of us born of him became sinners. Now, it also means this. Each person who is born of two human beings, they are what? Don't say a baby. They are sinners. That's why we became sinners. Adam and Eve sin. All human race became sinners in them. Understand? He was our federal head. He represented us. Understand that? He represented us. Adam represented us. In, then, is the, then God tells us, God is telling us His salvation plan. Then He says, um, by the obedience of one, by the obedience of one, many shall be made righteous. By the obedience of one is Christ. Christ's obedience, He become our representative head. So now you have a choice. There is Adam, the representative head, we all became sinners. There's Christ, man represent man, the perfect man represent man, 
we can all be made righteous. Do you see the reversal? So it's your choice. I choose to continue to be Adam's race or I believe in Christ and I transfer citizenship to be a child of God. Understand that? That is why there is this transfer. That's what the Bible is explaining. By one man's sin, by one man's disobedience, many, made un man, many were unrighteous. By one man's obedience, many made righteous. Now I give you a big hint already. So now I ask you, just now I drew this. Why must Christ be born as a baby and then grow up to be a man? Why can't he just come as a man, fully grown man? Too easy already, right? Too easy already. Sujin. Why must Christ be born as a baby and grow up to be a man? We talked about representative, then we talked about by one man's obedience, we can be made righteous. Okay, why must Christ be born as a baby and grow up as a man? He has come as a fully man before. Why? Esther, you want to try? Why? This Christmas, we are going to sing about the holy infant. Why? Why must he come as an infant? Anyone want to try? Oh, Justin wants to. Huh? Yes, Vincent. Yeah, Vincent. Okay, he had to live a perfect life. Just now we read, by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous, right? Obedience, perfect obedience. Now, if, if Christ came, fully grown adult, then in the next second, he went to the cross to die for us, substitute us. Will it work? Why will it not work, Jung? Yes, just now we said by one man's obedience, right? If he just turned up as an adult, went to the cross, did he obey God in all the Ten Commandments and all the commandments? Did he have a chance to? No. God says, now, in order to reverse the process, Adam sinned, we all became sinners. In order to reverse the process where we can have perfect, um, to be considered as perfect, we must obey God, right or not? Can we obey God after the fall? Can we do this? We are born, grew up, perfect, can or not? We know we can't. God knows we cannot. But yet, in order for one man's obedience, many be made righteous to reverse the process, Christ must come and obey perfectly for us. Understand that? Remember substitutionary? Christ only not only substitute by his death, Christ also lead a perfect life. In our, for, on our behalf. Do you know why the day you are saved, God stamp on you? Perfect, justified, as if have not sinned. Do you know why? Because, because why? Because Christ did it for you and I. This, as we all know, is called the active obedience. Christ actively, as an infant, lived a perfect life. That's why we can reverse the process to come under Him. You see God's plan? Do you know that God thought through all this to save you and I? He went through all this for you and I. His obedience on earth was on our behalf. That is why He must come as an infant and grow up. Why can't He be born of Joseph and Mary? Why can't He be born of Joseph and Mary? Why? Esther. Why must be virgin birth? They are still sinners because Adam and Eve are sinners, right? If Christ was born of two human beings, Christ was born of two human beings, then Christ would not be sinless, right or not? Why do I want to say this? Because there are Christians who also deny the virgin birth. Bible colleges teach that. They say virgin birth is not important. Why do we make a big deal? You know why they say that? Because scientists say that there is, in the whole history of mankind, not a single human being has been born of a virgin. It is very foolish to believe such thing. Christianity is illogical. So Christians get very embarrassed, so they say, no, 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 not virgin birth. Actually, uh, it was born of uh, Mary and Joseph. But the Bible tells us Joseph and Mary had no sexual relationships before Jesus Christ was born, right? 
So what, they, what, do, what do Christians say and unbelievers say? Actually, Mary had the secret love affair with a Roman soldier. In order to say, in order to say come on, I don't believe in virgin birth. It's very embarrassing. People laugh at Christianity. Do you understand why virgin birth is so important? It has all to do with our salvation. Christ said, I come through this form. Let us defend the work that he did. Understand that? All right, so we understand many things today. And now the question remains. Um, let's turn back to our BBK book. Back to our BBK book. Let me see. Okay, so based on this, is Christ being 100% God important? Very important because of all this. Is Christ 100% man important? It's important because of all this. Christ did all this. Did he need to do it? No. But you know how complex this is? And Christ willingly did it? So I want to finish this lesson again by reminding us when we know all this, it's not to bloat up our minds. It's to love our Saviour. God, I will not hold back anything else from you now because now I understand what you did for me. And when you understand this, your salvation is also very firm. You understand how you're saved, all right? Which we'll cover more later. Okay, so uh, turn back to our BBK books, please. On page 58, all right? Page 58. Page 58. Now, the last part. Um, here we say, We are justified by His blood and saved from the wrath. We are reconciled to God. We are made, once we are aliens, once we were aliens, but by the blood of Christ, we were made close to God, nigh to God, reconciled with Him, being citizens and members of the household of God. Once we were enemies, now we are reconciled, friends and children of the Holy God. So, this is, all this is to reconcile us to God the Father. Christ did this to reconcile us to God the Father. We were saying Christmas hymns. O be ye reconciled, be ye reconciled to God. Peace on earth, goodwill to men. What peace? We are reconciled to God. Alright, so I hope this lesson gives us a clearer understanding of Christ. Let us pray. <laughs> now, we will cover 13 key well-known denominations. Their timeline and how they split. How the groups form. Okay, so let us turn to your diagram, please. 